Okay, so this is um, my great pleasure to uh, today have this uh, discussion interview with uh, Fold Doolittle. Um, Fold Doolittle is Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at uh, Dalhousie University in Canada. Um, Ford has made very important contributions to evolutionary biology, to molecular biology. Uh, he grew up in, the, in Illinois, in the US. Uh, he did undergraduate studies at Harvard and graduate studies at Stanford, then moved to New York, and in 1971 to Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Dalhousie University, where he has been ever since. So it's been about uh, 50 years. Um, in 2013, he was awarded Canada's uh, highest scientific prize, the Gerhard Herzberg Gold Medal in Science and Engineering. Fold Doolittle is also a member of the US National Academy of Science and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Very interestingly for us today, Fold Doolittle has worked with a number of philosophers and he co-authored papers with them, uh, including Marina Malley, Andrew Inkman, Tyler Burnett, and many others, also with scholars who uh, work really at the interface between uh, biology and philosophy, and there are several of them, including Eric Batest, who is now based in Paris. Since 2020, uh, Ford is also cross-appointed with the Department of Philosophy at uh, Dalusi. And of course, we are interested today in knowing more about how Ford's work lies at the interface between conceptual biology, experimental biology, and philosophy. So before starting, Ford, how are you doing today? I'm good. By the way, though, it's, we say Dalhousie, not Dalhousie. Oh, Dalhousie. Thank you. That's, that's uh, yeah. Okay, that's very French. Um, so well, thank, thank you again for accepting the idea of this uh, interview. And we start with a question about your own scientific work. So what do you see as your most significant scientific contributions? And to what extent are these contributions of the conceptual or theoretical nature? Right, so I, I, I sent you a list of my top 20 best hits, as it were, but well, pared down to 14. And, and it, it, it's interesting because I, about um, the majority of the nine out of 14 were conceptual, I would say, in nature. Um, I, I very much believe, in fact, that to reach a large audience, you have to actually be a scientist rather than a philosopher. Um, and and furthermore, to have credibility as a science scientist, you actually have to produce some, some uh, actual data, um, empirical results, I think. Um, and then that establishes, gives you the right to speculate. Um, but, so it, it's interesting because I think, I think it's true that, that for a scientist, and scientists generally reach a larger audience than philosophers do, um, Credibility is important in some way. So, you know, the, I mean, Ernst Meyer was obviously a very philosophically inclined biologist, but the fact that he had a background in ornithology was something that people could respect. So, so I think that's important. And, and I, so about, about um, you know, a minority of my things have been um, experimental contributions, but I don't think that they're trivial ones. Um, and, and I think in some ways too, my conceptual uh, interventions have been, it, it's, it's, I remember as a graduate student, I was particularly good. My, my supervisor, who was Charlie Yanofsky, thought that I was especially good at thinking of reasons why I didn't have to do the experiment that he suggested because it wouldn't actually mean anything anyway. And I think that's sort of the contrarian attitude that I've always had. You know, so I, I, I think I will take what most scientists are thinking and, and think, you know, maybe it could be something else. Maybe an, another explanation would be appropriate, which is a very philosophical attitude, I think. Um, within science, it sometimes comes across as contrarian or, uh, you know, obstreperous. So you have to be careful about that. But. I think that's my general approach. 
And just incidentally, can there be a sort of a negative aspect to it in the sense, not, not negative in the sense that it would be bad, but in the sense that I remember that in an interview in uh, Plus Genetics a few years ago, you said that one problem was that you had sent papers to Nature or other journals where you were saying something about, you know, we should not do things this way, right? like, you know, attacking the consensus. And it seems that those journals have very strong difficulties accepting papers which are negative in the sense that they are critical. Well, I, think, I think that's true. I mean, I think science in general is very uh, verificationist and positivist. I mean, you know, I mean, it, if if you if you haven't got something to offer, then then you shouldn't speak up and you know, that sort of thing. So I I think it's uh, particularly the major journals, but but probably all the journals in some ways would accept a positive result and they won't accept the negative result um, you know something just doesn't work so yeah no i think that's that's correct we're very verificationist okay and it seems it seems to me that eliminating bad solutions is very important so eliminating the experiments you shouldn't do is very important eliminating the bad views should be something very important but it's very difficult to value it in current science i, I think that's true yeah okay could you i know it's a little bit like difficult to say uh, something about this, but can you say just a little bit more about uh, the among your more conceptual contributions, which one or a few of them would you single out as particularly important uh, for you and or for the field? So among the conceptual contributions. Right. Well, I, I mean, the one I'm currently working on is the one that interests me the most, I guess, which is um, so back when the Gaia hype, when Jim Lovelock first published his little book on the Gaia hypothesis, which is the first thing that I was aware of, uh, me and most other Darwinians reacted very strongly against it, I think, because we could not conceive of um, the biosphere as a whole as being anything that would meet Lewinton's recipe, which I think is what we sort of thought that loose by natural selection was in those days and, and still do think it is in those days or at these days. So um, I, I'm, I've been trying in the last four, four or five years to, to reverse that opinion, uh, at least to come up with some way in which it is legitimate to talk about the Gaia, uh, you know, the whole biosphere as if it had adaptations. So I, that's still a work in progress. I'm not sure whether that's going to succeed or not. Uh, I, at the moment, I'm thinking that what we need to do is stop thinking about evolution by natural selection in terms of Lewin's recipe and something, and, and substitute for that something a little bit more like David Hall's replicator interactor framework. And I think, I think that's uh, a shift that's going to be forced upon us by the increase in the data from communities, you know, like metagenomic data, which is community data, not, not individual taxon data. So I, and I, and I think that that field is lacking a theoretical underpinning. Um, there's a lot of just data accumulation that's going on now in microbiomics. So I'm kind of thinking that, that, uh, that David Hall's way of thinking about evolution by natural selection is superior or more embracing than is uh, Richard Lewinton's, and that we should make that switch, which I think you would probably agree is not one that most people are willing to make yet. So that it is very, very much of a Lewinton's recipe based understanding of what evolution by natural selection is. So that's what I'm trying to do now is to try to catalyze that shift. That's very interesting and also very interesting that you mentioned exactly the conceptual topic on which you're working at the moment. Uh, if, if you're asked what kind of conceptual contribution of yours was um, the most impactful on uh, your fellow biologists, would that be the tree of life? Would that be, would, would, what would that be? Probably the tree of life stuff, I guess. Um... I mean, I think that's what I got the Hertzberg gold medal for and the million dollar grant that came with it. But, um, and in some ways I think, 
Well, it's, it's really very interesting of that story because Science Magazine asked me to come up with the names of some people who should write um, review articles for the special edition on revolution. And I said, well, why not me? And I, I guess they, they couldn't get their minds around how, how could you ask somebody to advise people and not take him as one of the advisees. So, so the, I think they, they were sort of forced to take it. And then I, I collected together a bunch of thoughts that, that had been bur burbling around in the field already. Um, particularly amongst several other people, and and package that uh, in terms of you know the challenge to the tree of life that Latovine transfer represents, and I think and, and that paper was fairly speculative. I mean, I I did sort of say in, in that paper, you know, if it turns out that such and such is, that Latovine transfer is really important, then then it means this, and um, I was quite careful actually the way I wrote that paper. Um, and it has turned out that way, so so I'm, I was pleased with that result. But I but I but I don't think it's a particularly interesting um, contribution. I just was an important one at the time. Okay, that's that's interesting. Okay, I now turn to my second question, which is um, about the impact of philosophy and philosophers on your work. You already mentioned a little bit of that. Um, so the question is, is how have you used philosophy in your own work? Uh, did philosophy play any role in what you see as your most important scientific contributions? And has the work of some philosophers be inspiring and or useful to your own scientific work? And if so, which philosophers and why? Right, that's a complicated question uh, for which I have a possibly relevant answer. Um, and so I've been hanging around with philosophers for a very long time. Um, uh, Elliot Sober came to give a, well, actually I've known Elliot Sober because we, he helped me buy a coffee maker <laughs> at some meeting in Los Angeles. And, and that's the first philosopher I ever met. He's a very nice guy. Um, and then he came to Dalhousie to give a seminar at some point. And uh, Rich Campbell, who's in the philosophy department and Gordon McEwitt, who's in the, King's College, basically a philosopher or historian of, of biology. Um, and I put together a reading group to read some of Elliot Sober's papers before he showed up here. And we've been meeting every other week, more or less, for about, I think, maybe 35 years now or something like that. So it's a very robust group. And, and when I did have some extra money, I hired Maureen O'Malley, who was the first of my postdocs, uh, who was a philosopher or, well, she was, I got a PhD in sociology, I think. But, um, because I had always been more interested in, in concepts than in data, I think. But I, I also think that most of the conceptual stuff that I have done or contributed to, um, I, I mean, I think um, one of the things that I, I, I mean, I so I think molecular biology and genomics as sciences lag behind uh, whole animal or whole organism biology in terms of the philosophical impact. Uh, I mean, I think that the new synthesis was by whole organism biologists, not, not molecular biologists. and and molecular biologists tend to be very here and now oriented. And even though there's a whole field of molecular biogenetics now, it, it um, often embodies or embraces uh, philosophical concepts, which are kind of out of dated, out, outdated in terms of what um, whole organism biologists might, or larger organism biologists might think. So I think in some ways, what I've been doing is importing ideas from from the philosophy and biology and, and uh, larger organisms into smaller organisms or into the molecular biology and genomics area. Sorry about that noise. I hope you can't hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can hear the noise, but uh, but uh, it's it's perfectly uh, perfectly uh, okay. So so in a certain sense, my impression is that you've done your own conceptual slash philosophical work, and then sometimes you 
went to philosophers to um, see if there was support for the kind of uh, views no, you no, no, I, I certainly have done that too. Um, I mean, I, 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 so I, I mean, I think that the selfish DNA hypothesis, which was probably my first philosophical intervention, um, uh, it came from reading Richard Dawkins' uh, The Selfish Gene book, uh, quite clearly in some ways. Um, and so I think I have always been sort of interested in, in general biological theory and importing that into my own particular field. Um, I, I'm sorry, I lost the question. What was the question? The question was uh, this sort of uh, temporal priority. Some people read philosophy and then it's oh, inspiring right. for their biology. In your, in your case, I think it's both ways, but often the other yeah, way- it is, well, it is both ways. I mean, sometimes it's, it's philosophical considerations which lead me into the intervention and sometimes it's really the science. I, I think I um, indicated that. Yes, I did. So, some, some places the philosophy leads to science in the lateral gene transfer area, for instance, the, the tree of life. I'd say that the science really led the way there and it was really quite unexpected scientific results that, that stimulated the philosophical conceptual idea. Um, so it, it, it's both ways, I think. Um, yeah. And just a quick comment or question rather on David Hall, because it seems to me that David Hall was very uh, influential at some point. Many people were talking about the replicator interactor distinction, not many, but quite many people were talking okay. about this. And then it seems that it became less important to uh, biologists, but also to philosophers, like people very, yeah important in the field, including Peter Gottfried uh, said, you know, in the end, Lewontin's recipe is, is in fact better than the replicator interactor, even though he was very close to, to David Hall. So there was this idea that maybe the replicator interactor distinction was not that useful in the end. So just going back to this, because this is one illustration of a possible conceptual inspiration from a, a, a philosopher. Could, can, you, can you say a little bit more about how you think the replicator uh, interactor distinction could be more productive for some domains of current science than the traditional recipe of uh, Lewinton. Sure, I, um, I think I possibly could say something like that. And I'm sorry again about the noise, they're drilling upstairs and so there's nothing we can do about that. But um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, so I think it's driven by the increasing emphasis on uh, community genomics led by metagenomics and now by microbiomics and, and the whole of ion thinking and all that stuff that it seems to be driven by the, um, by the relative cheapness of, of DNA sequencing now, basically. Um, and, and I think that that, uh, and, and actually PGS, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith says in, in his little book on philosophy of biology, somewhere he says that that maybe the replicator interactor framework is more appropriate for dealing with symbioses and and things that resume rather than or recur rather than than reproduce and i think he's right about that and that's really what i'm trying to catalyze and and there's this recent book by uh arvid agman that i'm sure you have that book um i mean i think i think i think we're about to see a um a revolution in, in the way that we think about evolution by natural selection. And it, it's curious, and maybe you can help me with that. I'm not quite sure how we got off on the Lewinton's recipe track. It, you know, it, it's, it, it would be interesting to know. I mean, PGS is very, I mean, his book, 2009 book on Darwinian populations very much emphasizes Lewinton's recipe, I think, as, as a formulation. And this is uh, replica, replicator interactor thinking, um, mostly. Um, and I think, I think he's probably right about lower level, you know, up to the level of the organisms, but, but more complicated uh, multi-species interactions, I think probably uh, the replicator interactor framework works better. And, and it would be interesting to know how we got so focused on the differential reproduction as the only means by which evolution by natural selection occurs. Because I think, I think that's 
in general, I mean, I think that so-called universal Darwinism or cultural um, applications of Darwinian thinking uh, are Lewontin's recipe based. Is that correct? I think that's probably so. I think so. I think so. So, so I, that, that, I mean, I, that's an interesting mis interesting because because PGS does say in that book that you know there it's not quite clear what evolution by natural selection natural selection actually means and and there are different idealizations or formulations of it and and some of some may be useful in some contexts and some not in others but there isn't necessarily a right way of thinking about it and so it's interesting to know how we got sidetracked mm -hmm. or, okay very, very interesting. One, one short question about um, ENCODE, because you, you've, you've, you've uh, mentioned uh, the, in, in several of your work, uh, the, you've formulated a sort of uh, critique of ENCODE and the way ENCODE people might have missed the importance of some distinctions, some of them philosophical, about the definition of functions. Can you say just a very, you know, sure. just a few words about this? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I do think that, that um, genomics, genomicists in general, particularly those who study the human genome, um, biomedical researchers, are very pan adaptationist. Um, they, they, you know, they, they totally. Well, they probably haven't read Lewin and Gould, 1979, anyway, but but they would probably reject that message. And, and this debate has been going on for a long time. I mean, it happened in the selfish DNA debates back in around 1980. Um, and people pointed out that, you know, some things, some vertebrates like the lungfish have 40 times as much DNA as we do. So either you got to think that the lungfish is 40 times as complicated as we humans are, which seems unlikely, um, or 39 40 of its DNA is like junk. Or maybe its whole genome is more junkish because the same amount of function is distributed over 40 times as much DNA. You know, I mean, I, I still think we haven't dealt properly with that question, nor do we, you know, and philosophers still debate about the meaning of function. Um, obviously they do. And, and I, I think maybe that's not an easy question to answer. What do we mean by function? But but the molecular biologists and genomicists who led the ENCODE project, I, I think that they thought that function was like pornography, you know, when you see it. And, and that's, it. you know, end of story. Don't bother me with this philosophical crap. Just go for the function. And, and, and I don't think they know what it means. So that's a problem. So um, next question is about the uh, potential contribution of philosophy to science more generally. And of course, we've already talked about that. And maybe the best way to talk about that is to talk about it, given your own experience. But still, more generally, I mean, you know, we, we find all sorts of uh, scientists who say that philosophy can be extremely important for science, uh, including Einstein, including, I don't know, Carlo Rovelli in, in, in physics, for example. But we also know that many scientists are extremely skeptical, to say the least, on the possibility for anything philosophical to contribute to science. What is your general, if any, your general view about, about this? Well, I'm not sure I have a general view. I, I can only really speak about biology because I don't know how important philosophy of physics is to actually physicists. And I don't actually know how you tell the difference between a theoretical physicist and a philosopher of physics to tell the truth. Um, it's a little bit easier in biology, I think. And well, uh, I think it would be ba a bad thing if philosophers played a major role and and uh, in the practice of biology in the sense that, you know, they insisted that we not um, proceed with research until we have a more precise definition of our terms, because I think that would be, that would be analysis, lead to analysis paralysis, as it were, we would, we would. So I think, I think successful science, at least in biology, depends upon a certain imprecision in the definition of terms. And, and you know, like, or gene, for instance, has clearly changed its meaning um, throughout. It's morphed in terms of what it means. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And I think had we 
define, tried to define it more precisely, we would have gotten bogged down and probably not progressed as far. So, but, so I, I think that the disciplines need to be separate. I think that philosophy of biology can get a little bit too isolated and, and so that philosophers of biology can sometimes worry about problems that biologists don't consider important um, and, and or have already solved um, in some way. So I think, you know, and particularly I think philosophers of biology are often outdated in their concepts. You know, they, they learned some biology when they were undergraduates and they're keeping, keeping going on that, whereas biology has moved beyond that. So I, I, I think it would be good if there are more people that move back and forth between the two disciplines, but I don't think they should be the same discipline. And I, and I also think, as I said in my comments, that I think, I mean, PGS, I'm sure other people have said this too, you know, there's philosophy of science and then there's philosophy of nature. And, and um, philosophy of science, I think, is an independent discipline and probably should stay separate from the science. But philosophy of nature is very close to theoretical biology, and I don't really know that there's a difference. So, and, and the, one, the one thing that I said in my notes to you was, uh, so I, I got an art college degree at the age of 72 or something like that. And, and it's interesting to contrast the role of art historians and art philosophers in the training of practicing artists versus the role of the, the non-role of historians and philosophers of, of science and tra the training of scientists, right? I mean, it, the disciplines are very separate, whereas in, in art schools, they're practically the same discipline. I, I think that's an interesting contrast. I don't know in whose favor <laughs> that contrast would be, but it's an interesting one. Probably, I guess, because there is this assumption that knowing the past can be fruitful for your own art and not so much for your own biology, for example. I guess, I guess. No, that no, I, think that, I think that's true. And I think that that's an assumption. And of course, an old guy like me, you know, I get a little bit irritated when, when undergraduates or graduate students are debating the same, you know, they're having the same debate that we had 50 years ago. And here's how it comes out. And, and you don't even know about this. And, and they would say, well, history is irrelevant. You know, it's all, yeah. So I, I, I think that the practicing scientists are um, willfully ignorant of their own history. And sometimes it's to their detriment. So this, this, this leads me directly to my next question, but we already addressed that to a large extent. So the, the question is, do you consider that there is today a divorce between science and philosophy? If so, what are the causes of this situation? Um, is the divorce uh, detrimental or not? And should we try to recombine science and philosophy? And if so, how? So you already said much about this, but I maybe- I have already said that. I've already yeah. answered that in a way. I mean, I think, well, I. I think people like me are useful. Uh, I think uh, practicing biologists who are interested in philosophy, the philosophical questions are useful. And, and um, certainly philosophers like Elliot Sober, who's basically a theoretical biologist, as far as I can tell, um, are very useful too. But I think the disciplines should be separate. Um, I mean, I. So for the last almost 10 years now, I've been more or less trying to make myself into a philosopher of biology. And I've gotten to know this community reasonably well. And, and it, it's a very, I mean, you know, very bright people in it. Sometimes they're wasting their times, I think, because they're not doing anything that really is interesting to biologists or, um, but, you know, but it, that's true of biology too, so. They're interestingly parallel. And, and, and to some extent, there is a contradiction here in the sense that if philosophy of science uh, and philosophy of biology um, are separate from the science, then not addressing uh, biologically relevant questions is not that a big deal. I mean, it's, you know, it could, oh. I mean, I mean it, it depends. I think you have two critiques. One is that people use old fashioned biology, which is completely outdated. I think that is a problem. But the other aspect, which is that a biologist 
coming in a conference in philosophy of biology, not really recognizing his or her biology, that is not necessarily a problem if it means that the question being raised is different, because that would mean that it's normal no, for no, different no, I, 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 I understand that. Um, I also understand the career structure of younger, of younger philosophers, which is pretty much like the career structure of younger biologists in the sense that you, you, know, you want to be radical. You want to say something that's different enough from what your peers said that you'll be noticed, but not so different is that you'll be discarded as crazy. And uh, that's, a, that's a challenge that both sides face in, in some ways. And, and I, think, I think philosophy can go off on little tangents where you know there's a paper and then somebody writes a counter paper and then there's a counter counter paper and and that isn't doesn't necessarily mean that it's a particularly interesting problem. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Of course, for the people like me who have tried to say that it's very important for some uh, areas of philosophy to really import the scientific problems, you know, really the idea being that philosophy yeah. can address scientific problems. Of course, from this point of view, it's a little bit different in the sense that identifying the right scientific problems uh, is absolutely crucial and providing a philosophically interesting uh, answer to those problems become, becomes crucial. And this is very difficult because most of the time there is this challenge of the disciplines being different. And as you said, it can be very difficult for a philosopher even working with biologists to be accepted by a biological community. What is your feeling in terms of those um, sort of disciplinary boundaries? Uh, is it easy for a biologist to enter the, philo the philosophy of biology community? Is it easy in your view for a philosopher of biology trained in philosophy to enter the community of biologists? What are exactly the, the barriers here? I, I, I think it's not all that difficult. Um, I, I certainly, most of my postdocs of worse than like seven or eight now in the last five or six, 10 years, um, had some biological knowledge, right? I mean, often they got their undergraduate degree in biology um, and then they got their PhD in philosophy. Um, and I, I think most biologists think that philosophers are really smart um, and think rationally and stuff like that, which philosophers in general are. Um, so I, as a biologist, I would be happy to take somebody whose undergraduate degree was in philosophy as a graduate student. Um, I mean, they would have some trouble with the, with the, with the uh, prerequisites for, for a degree. And, um, but that considered, I think, I think that's, uh, I may, maybe I'm not typical, but I think I am that, that I think biologists in general think that philosophers are very well trained, um, very particularly trained, but also quite rational and therefore would be useful as, as postdocs or grad students, um, provided they learn some biology. And, and, uh, and I, I, I suspect that the, uh, the opposite direction is, well, yeah, I think, I think that's true too. I mean, I guess my postdocs are pretty much in that opposite direction. So um, I, I'm not sure how many mature biologists go into philosophy. I, I mean, there is this negative, you know, notion of philosophers, where when a retired biologist does philosophy, um, uh, because it's easier <laughs> uh, and doesn't require a lab. But it doesn't require a lab, but it's not necessarily easier. And, and, and you've mentioned before some people who were trained in biology and then got a second training in philosophy and, and, and joined your research environment, for example. So I think in addition to this philosophers you, you, you mentioned, there is also this trend, which is of course very small, but there is a small number of biologists who get interested sure. in, in philosophy. Yeah, well, particularly, particularly young people, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting, okay. My um, last question, again, very much related to what, what we already said, but uh, this is um, a question about the role of conceptual thinking and foundational thinking in science more uh, generally. Um, I've read, uh, for example, I know you, 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 you know, uh, the, the, you know, you knew Carl Rose, Rose very well and, and his work very well. And I remember that he wrote in a, in a, in a paper in 2004 
that um, it was uh, a society that permits biology to become an engineering discipline that allows that science to slip into the role of changing the living world without trying to understand it is a danger to itself. That was you know, that kind of big claim about uh, the, the direction biology was, was taking. And in general, I think there is this tendency among some scientists to say that the kind of science we have today is full of data, very interesting data, deluge of data, but we need more thinking, more conceptual thinking to really uh, put some order in this. And I wanted to know if you share this view or if quite the contrary, you think that this is well done at the moment, there's no need for more of that. You know, what is your opinion about this? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I shared Carl Woese's um, in the, his attitude about the importance of conceptual things. I, I mean, I think I agree with that. I, I don't often agree with his attitude, which was very much a personal paranoid one in some ways, but um, so I, I'm not sure I totally agree with everything he would have said, but I, but I, think, I think that biology has become very positivist, very verificationist, very, um, Assuming that it, 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 you know, that more data will answer the questions, and I think, I think it often doesn't. And in some ways, I think biology is, is basically a sort of a fraudulent discipline in the sense that it's pretending to be a science, but it's really about history. I mean, it really is, um, you know, just about things that happened in the past and therefore have an imprint on the present. And it's really just history, but we pretend it's science, and therefore we get funded at, uh, you know, hundred times the level at which you guys get funded. So I, I worry about that sometimes. Um, yeah. So. And in terms of uh, um, very practically, in terms of um, trying to, <coughs> sorry, trying to uh, get biologists know better. Uh, their history and maybe the philosophy of their science and the other way around for philosophers. Do you think that sort of double trainings, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of having a minor and major, what, what works in your, in your experience? Because you've seen quite a lot of people having yeah, the double, well, I, what works so, in practice? Yeah, our philosophy department does teach a philosophy of biology course. And, and uh, the majority of the students in that course are actually biologists because they're more biology students than there are philosophy students for sure. Um, and I think that's really good for them. Uh, and, and they probably often take it thinking, oh, this will be easy. Um, and it turns out to be very hard, but I also think it turns out to be very challenging. So I, um, I, I have no reason to, to I mean, I, I would strongly recommend that all biology departments have a philosopher and a historian of biology uh, on their staff if they're big enough to house them. Um, and and I, think, I think that in general philosophy needs in order to protect itself in some ways um, to reach out and, and integrate with the sciences in a way that respects the, or the independent interests of philosophers. But um, yeah, no, so I, I, I would prefer, uh, or I would like to see a, a stronger integration of philosophical and historical thinking in, in biology departments in general. And, and does it also apply to uh, biology labs? So there, there are a number of biology labs with uh, so-called embedded philosophers. Do you think that that is useful or not that much? Oh yeah, no, I think, I think it is very useful. Um, I mean, often, as you know, those philosophers wind up going native as it were and, and becoming actual scientists rather than philosophers. Um, but sometimes it's the other way around, I guess. So um, yeah, no, I think that that is very useful. And, and um, certainly here, Dow Housie, where, where King's College has been a source of undergraduates and graduate students who are interested in doing biology or working in a lab. That's always always worked out quite well, I think. And, and you know, it's surprising to them sometimes to realize that we're not just making up the data. <laughs> so. 
Okay, very good. Is there anything that you would like to add to this uh, discussion? No, um, I, think, I think we're good. Well, thank you very much, Ford. That was uh, great. Um, and um, um, I really look forward to uh, more interactions.